Good evening, everyone. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself before I start talking to you about the inspiration for my products and how I developed them. I was born in India and moved in to the United States when I was one and a half. And this slide, you can see me watching the Apollo 11 mission. I was two and a half years old at that time. That was nearly 50 years ago now. 25 years later, I was finishing up my residency at the Cleveland Clinic, and serendipity hit, and I met a ski instructor that I fell in love with. We, I, we moved to Montana um, about a year and a half later. We have three beautiful children, and I have a busy dermatology practice, and um, we're on our fifth house renovation. But in the midst of all of that, inspiration hit, and I just decided to run with it. I never thought that I would be a product developer or an inventor, but now I have a U.S. patent for technology to make capacitive um, touchscreen styluses, and I manufacture both of the products here in Montana. So my inspiration was in 2011. I got my first iPhone at that time. If you may remember, we had to wait four extra years to get the iPhone, and we were sitting there with our flip phones and Blackberries, and boom, in 2011, we got our iPhone. And I loved it for all of its features, but I still always made bad texts, and it was really hard for me to edit emails, and I think my kids have some pictures of the texts that I sent <laughs> saved on their phone so they can blackmail me later. And um, my daughter was the inspiration. She was talking to her friend who recently got an iPhone, and she said to her friend those magic words, your phone screen needs heat to work. And then everything fell into place for me because I realized why I was imprecise. When I would want to touch my phone, I would want to go straight down, and my fingernail would get in the way. I don't wear really long fingernails, but it was just enough that it wouldn't activate the screen, and I had to put my finger flat. And when I put my finger flat, I covered more of the screen, and it became less accurate. At least my touch felt less accurate. On my old phone, um, it had what was called a pressure-sensitive touch screen. So that meant I could push down with any object. It could be a pencil, it could be a, you know, your finger, your fingernail, and it would activate the touch screen. Newer smartphones actually use a technology called capacitive um, touchscreens, where they sense a change in electrical charge. So that means that your skin has to contact it for it to activate. So I thought, well, maybe there's a way I can fix this. And I always went back to what Steve Jobs said in 2007 when he introduced the iPhone. He said, we're not going to use the stylus because we have the best pointing device in the world. We will use our fingers. And I thought, well, yeah, my fingernails are too long. I have ranchers that have huge hands. Maybe there's a way we can equalize that and make everybody precise when they need to be. And since the smartphone was becoming the most quickly adopted technology in human history, I thought there may be other people that would want a device like this. So then I had to start prototyping because, you know, I had to see if my idea would work. And you can see here, I use things around my house. I first started with aluminum foil that I would mold into different shapes to see if it would activate my touch screen. I thought, maybe I can make a conductive nail polish, and that would save, you know, I could make it easy for women that had longer nails to be able to activate their screen. Well, that didn't work. You can do an experiment at home if you have an iPhone. You can take a penny, you know, which is made out of copper that is very conductive, and put it on your screen. And if it's flat, it'll activate it. If you put it on the, on the side, it won't. So a capacitive touchscreen not only needs a change in charge, but it also needs a minimum surface area to activate it. And so my goal was to find that minimum surface area. I researched the existing styluses that you can see in the slide. Everybody knows what they look like. They're a pen-shaped stylus, and they have a rubber tip at the, top, at the bottom. And when you touch your screen, it compresses to make a surface area that will activate the touch screen. But my problem was I didn't really like that because I, it was hard for me to use a pen, you know, when I had to multi-touch and do those other gestures. And so I thought, why don't I just use my pointer finger? So I came up with this guitar pick with aluminum foil, 
and it did the job for me. I could see what I wanted to touch. I would get more sensory input into my finger because more neurons were being activated you know, there, and so you can localize your touch better. And I would hear a little tapping noise to know that I had touched the screen. So once I prototyped my pro product, you know, I had to do the next step. So I decided to go to an engineering firm to see if it was physically possible to make this product. And they made 3D um, files for me that we ended up 3D printing parts from, and then we would coat them in a conductive paint, and they actually worked on the touchscreen the way I wanted. So the next step in manufacturing was to get a manufacturing tool that would um, work for injection molding, and we were able to do that in Florence, Montana. You can see my final products that I developed. One's called a tech tip, which goes on your index finger, and you can see how you can see what you want to do. You can highlight, you can draw, and I decided to go to the next step that I always envisioned doing, and that was making an artificial nail that works as a stylus. It can be in integrated into many different manicures. So once the products were developed, I went to the Consumer Electronics Show in 2013 just to get feedback on the products to see what other people thought of them. And if you've ever been to the Consumer Electronics Show, it's pure chaos. There's thousands of exhibitors, lots of attendees. Many of the attendees were male, you know, just because it was a tech conference. And, you know, when they would go by our booth, they would sort of, you know, people walk by really fast, and all of a sudden they'd sort of look and come over and say, what did you do? And I'd show them, and they'd say, oh, is that an app? And I'd say, no, that's, I have a stylus on my finger, and I'm, that's my stylus working on the screen. And they didn't even know that it was a problem for women, that, you know, that it might be an issue, that their late nails might be long. So after the Consumer Electronics Show, we got lots of publicity. Um, it was reported about in four different continents. I've shipped the products to six different continents. So that was my journey of innovation. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and talk about innovation in America and sort of the underdogs of inner innovation. In the United States, you're more likely to innovate if you're an immigrant from a foreign country where you graduated with a STEM advanced degree, and you're more likely to innovate if you're an affluent white male. Women, unfortunately, innovate at a very low rate, at least what you can see by patents. Only 3% of patents are historically granted to women. And now, if you look at who's applying for patents, only 8% are the lead applicant on patents. If we continue at that rate, it will take about 100 years before we have parity with men on that. And the statistics for minorities are even, are even more dismal than that. So my journey of taking um, my product from an idea to a tangible um, thing was an amazing journey for me. And I would urge any one of you that if you have an idea, see if it's feasible. There's so many ways to crowdsource and fund, at least get some seed money to see if your idea would work. And I would urge you to have your children you know, work with things, fix things, think out of the box so they can become the next generation of innovators. Thank you so much.